Flight schools lined up to buy luxury light sport aircraft that cost $200,000, slick, lightweight, packed with tech, convinced the old $30,000 Cessna 152 was obsolete. But then, reality hit. The Federal Aviation Administration weight rules forced those light sport aircraft to chase speed with thinner, weaker structures, and those design choices started burning cash and breaking under student pilots. Why are schools now desperate to reclaim battered 1970s Cessnas? Just how wrong did the flying world get it, and what did those marketing brochures leave out? In 2004, the Federal Aviation Administration drew a line in the sand for light sport aircraft. Maximum gross weight was 1,320 pounds. Two seats, one engine, no retractable gear, and a top speed capped at 120 knots. Stall speed was 45 knots in clean configuration. These numbers were not suggestions, they were the hard limits every light sport aircraft designer had to work around. The rules were supposed to make flying more affordable and accessible, but they forced engineers into a corner. Every pound shaved from the airframe meant thinner skins, lighter gear, and less margin for error. If a plane went over the weight limit, it was out of the category, period. No exceptions, no creative accounting. That is why so many light sport aircraft are built from composites and aluminum so thin, you can almost see the rivet patterns from the inside. The Federal Aviation Administration intended safety and simplicity, but the reality was a generation of airplanes trying to chase performance while staying lightweight. The numbers looked great in the sales pitch, efficient, modern, fast enough to tempt a new student. But the moment you start squeezing a training airplane into 1,320 pounds, you are making trade-offs that do not show up until the first student comes in for a landing. The rule did not just shape the light sport aircraft market, it baked fragility into the very bones of these aircraft. Flight school owners saw the ads and started dreaming in spreadsheets. The pitch was irresistible, a brand new glass cockpit sport plane, sipping fuel, looking sharp on the ramp, and promising to attract a new generation of students. The glossy brochure promised low operating costs, high-tech safety features, and a cabin that felt more like a luxury car than a farm truck. The sales rep smiled and slid the order form across the table, just sign here, put down a hefty deposit, and get in line. Most factories needed at least six months to build and deliver your airplane. That is six months of capital tied up, six months where the plane is not earning a dime. But the promise of a modern fleet was too tempting for many schools to resist. Some owners convinced themselves the wait was worth it. After all, the numbers on paper looked unbeatable. 120 knots, 4 gallons an hour, leather seats, and a parachute system that made the insurance agent smile, at least at first. They imagined students lining up for demo flights, eager to post cockpit selfies, and tell their friends about the digital screens and Bluetooth audio. The reality was a line of checks written months before a single flight hour showed up on the books. While the old Cessna 152s kept flying, earning and taking daily abuse, the new sport planes sat in shipping crates or in customs, waiting for paperwork and final assembly. The gamble was simple, bet big on the future, or keep squeezing value out of a relic from the past. A student climbs into a Cessna 152 and immediately notices the difference. The yoke has weight. Every control input takes real effort. There is no autopilot, no flight director, no glass panel to hold your hand. You grip the yoke, feel the resistance, and realize this is not a video game. The airplane fights back, and that is exactly what it is supposed to do. Designed in the late 70s, the Cessna 152 was built for one job, surviving the mistakes of beginners. It cruises at just under 90 knots, but what it lacks in speed, it makes up for in feedback. Every bump in the air comes straight through the seat and into your hands. The rudder pedals are stiff, the pitch takes muscle, and the roll feels deliberate. Nothing happens by accident. You have to coordinate every movement, yoke, rudder, throttle, because the plane will not hide your errors. This is how pilots learn to fly, not just to manage systems. The slow speed gives you time to think on final approach, but it does not forgive sloppy technique. If you are high, you will float. If you are low, you will land short. The airplane does not trim itself or smooth out the ride. 
It forces you to develop muscle memory, to anticipate, to react with your whole body. Instructors call this stick and rudder flying, building the instincts that keep you safe when the wind kicks up or the engine coughs. The Cessna 152 does not flatter your ego. It exposes your mistakes, but it also lets you fix them before they become expensive. That is the secret behind its reputation as the best trainer ever made. It is heavy, honest, and built to take a beating. Every hour in the Cessna 152 is, is a workout, but it is also an investment in real flying skill. The first time a student sits in a modern light sport aircraft, it feels like stepping into a tech startup. Everything glows. The screens are bright, the switches are soft touch, and the stick moves with barely any pressure. It is quiet, almost clinical. The airplane glides through the air with fingertip inputs. You do not have to fight the yoke or muscle the rudder. The glass panel shows everything. Artificial horizon, synthetic vision, and even a moving map that tracks your every turn. For a new pilot, it feels like flying has finally caught up with the iPad era. But there is a catch hiding in all that comfort. The controls are so light that students start flying with their wrists instead of their arms. The airplane responds instantly to the smallest twitch, so it is easy to overcorrect. Instead of looking outside, students get glued to the screens, chasing digital needles and colored tapes. The cockpit turns them into system operators, managing menus and modes, trusting the displays more than their own senses. The airplane does not demand much physical effort, so the hands and feet never build the muscle memory that saves you when things get busy. Instructors notice the difference right away. Students in the light sport aircraft tend to spend more time on dual instruction before they are ready to solo. They are quick to learn the glass panel, but slow to master the basics, pitch, power, and coordination. The airplane flatters them at first. But the first sign of gusty wind or a sloppy approach and the lack of inertia shows its teeth. Mistakes that would be absorbed by a heavier, slower trainer are amplified. The result? More hours in the logbook, more money spent, and a student who knows how to work a touchscreen but still hesitates when the runway starts moving sideways. The comfort of the light sport aircraft comes with a hidden price. It teaches habits that do not always survive outside the world of smooth air and perfect weather. Touchdown isn't a gentle handshake with the earth. It's a physics experiment that happens every single lesson. When a student brings an airplane in for landing, there is no magic number that saves you. The formula is simple. Kinetic energy equals one half mass times velocity squared. Whether you are flying the 1,670-pound Cessna, 152, or a 1,320-pound composite sport plane, you are bringing down hundreds of thousands of foot-pounds of energy with every approach. The difference is what happens to that energy when things go sideways. In a Cessna 152, the main gear legs are solid vanadium spring steel. They flex, they bend, and they store up the shock like a coiled spring. Drop it hard and the gear legs bow out, then snap back, launching the airplane into a bounce with a metallic boing. It is not pretty, but it is honest. Most of that impact gets absorbed and released by the gear itself, not the rest of the airframe. Firewalls might wrinkle if you really botch it, but the plane is designed to take that kind of abuse and keep flying. Mechanics call it student proof. Now take the same landing in a modern light sport aircraft. The landing gear is usually a composite leaf, light, stiff, and engineered for minimum weight. There is only so much give before the structure reaches its limit. When a student slams it down, the gear does not flex much. Instead, the shock travels straight into the fuselage, right where the gear attaches. Sometimes it cracks, sometimes it delaminates, and sometimes you hear a pop that means a long phone call with the factory. The energy does not disappear, it just finds the weakest link. One student pilot remembered the first time he bounced a Cessna 152. He said he hit the runway so hard, he thought he had bought the airplane. But they just went up, came down, and taxied off. The instructor laughed and said, that is what the gear is for. Try that in some of the plastic wonders, and you are grounded until the part arrives from Europe, if it is even in stock. That is the real difference. 
One spreads the energy, the other transfers the pain. And in the world of flight training, that is the line between a quick lesson and a three-month repair. Crosswind days separate the toys from the tools. Out on the runway, a gust hits the side of a Cessna 152. The airplane rocks, but it keeps tracking straight. That is not luck, it is physics. With a gross weight of 1,670 pounds, the 152 carries real mass. When the wind tries to shove it, inertia fights back. The heavier airframe resists sudden attitude changes, so a beginner has time to react. In the cockpit, you feel the push, but it does not toss you around. You muscle the yoke, work the rudder, and the airplane answers with steady, predictable movement. That is why instructors call it stable, a word that means something when the wind is howling. Now put a student in a sport plane that weighs 1,320 pounds. Same gust, different story. The airplane jumps. Lighter weight means less momentum, so every puff of wind gets instant results. The nose swings, the wings dip, and the pilot chases the airplane instead of flying it. The controls are light, but the airplane feels nervous. Students start to overcorrect, left, right, up, down, never quite catching up. It is like trying to steer a shopping cart on ice. The airplane is not dangerous, but it demands more precision from a beginner who barely knows where to look. The difference is not just about comfort, it is about learning. A heavier trainer like the 152 gives students a buffer. They can practice crosswind landings, feel the wind's effect, and build real skill without being punished for every small mistake. The airplane's inertia soaks up the bumps, letting muscle memory develop the way it is supposed to. In a light sport, the same lesson turns into a fight. The wind wins more often, and confidence takes a hit. Physics does not care about price tags or touchscreen panels. When it comes to crosswinds, mass and momentum are the unsung heroes. That is why the old Cessna keeps its place on the line. It is not just forgiving in a bounce, it is planted when the wind gets mean. And for a flight school, stability is not just a comfort, it is a business asset. Every smooth landing, every lesson finished, keeps the airplane flying and the schedule full. The numbers will matter soon enough, but first, you need a machine that stays put when the weather turns ugly. A $200,000 sport plane sits in the hangar, silent and useless. The logbook is up to date, the fuel tanks are full, but the airplane is not going anywhere. All because a student landed a little too hard and cracked a composite bracket deep in the landing gear. The mechanic shakes his head, pulls out his phone, and fires off an email to the factory. The reply comes back two days later. The part is on back order, with an estimated lead time of 8 to 12 weeks. The factory is in Italy, and shipping is anyone's guess. While the clock ticks, the airplane bleeds money. Every day it sits, the school loses $100 or more in potential revenue. That is just the airplane. The instructor's schedule is upended, students are bumped, and the owner starts to wonder why he ever bought into the promise of modern aviation. Meanwhile, the Cessna 152 on the next row is back in the air by lunchtime. A bent gear leg? The mechanic grabs a replacement from the parts shelf, maybe even the local auto parts store, and gets to work. No waiting for customs, no tracking numbers from Europe, no sleepless nights. The old metal bird may look tired, but it keeps earning. The Cessna is reliable. The downtime is what kills you. A flight school cannot make money on a plane that is grounded for a quarter of the year. The numbers on the sales pitch never mention the cost of waiting. The reality is, every hour, a fancy new plane sits idle, is money down the drain. Money that could have paid for another student, another lesson, another day in the air. All it takes is one cracked bracket and a slow boat from Italy to turn a $200,000 investment into a very expensive paperweight. Insurance companies keep their own kind of logbook, one that tracks every claim, every repair bill, and every time a plane sits in the hangar instead of flying. For years, the pitch on light sport aircraft was simple. New tech, fewer moving parts, lower risk. 
but the numbers started telling a different story. Adjusters noticed a pattern. The shiny composite planes were showing up in the claim stack more often than the old Cessnas. Not for pilot error, those rates were about the same, but for things that should not break on a new airplane. Gear legs, attachment points, fuselage cracks after a rough landing. A broker lays it out. The Cessna 152, we see bent fairings, maybe a wrinkled firewall, but it is back in the air in days. The light sport aircraft, one hard landing and you're looking at a composite repair, factory parts, maybe a total loss. The repair bill can eat up half the hull value before you even get the part shipped. That is when the rate tables started to shift. Insurers do not care about how smooth the ride feels or how modern the avionics look. They care about loss frequency and how much it costs to fix. When claims for light sport aircraft kept stacking up, especially for structural damage that grounded planes for weeks or months, premiums climbed. Some underwriters started adding training surcharges for light sport aircraft or even refusing to cover student solo flights in certain models. The same owner who thought he would save money with a fuel-sipping sport plane now faced a bill that made the old Cessna's insurance look like a rounding error. The result? A flight school with a $200,000 light sport aircraft might pay more to insure it than to keep it fueled and maintained. Meanwhile, the battered Cessna 152 keeps earning, keeps flying, and keeps the broker's phone quiet. In the world of insurance, boring is profitable. And nothing is more boring or more reliable than a Cessna that has already survived a thousand student landings. Right now, hundreds of flight schools are tracking parts shipments and insurance hikes while their battered Cessnas fly another day. The lesson is not about nostalgia, it is about survival. When the stakes are student safety and business solvency, simplicity and toughness win. Old steel trumps new tech where it counts most in the real world. Which cockpit would you trust with your first solo? Let's hear your choice in the comments.